I don't really have anything to talk about today. And yet I'm starting a podcast recording. Isn't that the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? But I will, while you're listening to this epic intro music, come up with something. come up with something. Do you remember the last podcast where I was talking about how words have meanings? I'm going to need my glasses for this because I'm going to have to read something that I have saved on a tab in my browser. The tab's right there. I talked about how I was going to talk about words and why words are important, why having precision in the definition of words is important. And we have this problem in our language where, uh, and I'm not, here's the thing, I'm not trying to fall down on this or that political side because all sides in politics, they're always accusing each other of using words in, in weaselly ways. Uh, I think that they all do it, but I also think that very often they simply have different conceptions of what words mean and they talk past each other. So, you know, if you have a word, like, let me, let me just make up a word. Uh, let's let's make up a word, uh, vork. Okay, vork is a word I just made up. Let's say one group of people thinks that vork means cats, and another group of people think a vork means dogs, and they're talking to each other about whether or not someone should have a vork. That's what happens in politics a lot. I hate the I hate watching watching debates where you're like they sound like they're talking about the same subject, but they do, they're not really. So having words mean things and and having those word, the meanings of those words agreed on by everybody, that's important. It's, it's something that is, uh, you know, language policing, you can call it. I know that a lot of people don't like uh, that idea, but this is a very, very fundamental, and it really gets to just uh, not only allowing us to talk to each other, but if we can't talk to each other, we don't understand what each other want, what, what we want from each other. We can't negotiate. We can't do anything. Um, another one that really is a, a problem is is trying to use some official definition and say, "Oh, well, this is what this movement or this philosophy is." It's this little definition. Well, that's not really how it works. Um, you know, if it, what, what matters is is what actually happens when something, when when a movement or a person. You know, a person can't, it, this, this happens, you know, this the old classic upstanding pillar of the community that a defense lawyer will pull out to try to define the defendant who's on charges of rape or murder. It's like, well, okay, you can, you know, define that guy that way, but that doesn't change what he actually did. And that's the same, the same for organizations and movements. You can't just throw out a definition of they're an upstanding member of the community and let them off the hook for the bad stuff they did. That's also part of the story. So there, this jumbling of meanings of words is a real problem. And, and uh, this, uh, the Analects of Confucius, I know you're like, we never knew you were a Confucian. Well, I'm not a Confucian, but I'm not the kind of person who doesn't think that people all around the world said smart stuff um, that to me is kind of the definition of my worldview is that um, if the particular sources that I think are my favorites um, if I think that they're actually talking about reality well reality is accessible to everyone someone else must have seen something so I don't you know there's no culture in the world that I'm not willing to learn from and the, uh, particularly the Confucian culture which is uh, you know kind of time-tested got to be something to it. So the particular uh, part, I don't know how you refer to things in the Analects, but it's usually recorded as Analects 13.3, and I read this in college when I was doing comparative religion, and uh, it just stuck with me because it just, I was like, yes, exactly. Um, it, uh, Confucius or Kung Fu Tzu, or I don't, you know, don't know Chinese, but I do know that Confucius is a Latinized version of the original, which is Kung, I think Kung Fu Tzu or Kung Fu Tzu. Um, 
I wish I knew. I should probably study how to pronounce ch Chinese before I start talking about Chinese classics. Um, but anyway, he's being questioned. This is a, a very common thing in philosophy in the ancient world. It's not just in China, but you know, you see this sort of thing. I mean, you see this in the gospel. You see this in Greek philosophy. Um, you know, someone comes up to ask someone a question. You see it in the the uh, the hadith the, the hadith of the of, of Islam. You see this in um, you see this everywhere. Really, it's 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 a very common. Uh, way to write philosophy where you tell a story about someone who came to a very smart person and asked them a question and here's what the smart person says. So the person was talking about um, uh, in order to administer the government what is the first thing? What's the first thing? And uh, the answer is to rectify names meaning to you know clarify the way what how we refer to things and I'm going to paraphrase this and here's the thing I understand how ironic it is for me to be paraphrasing a translation of an ancient classic not only in another language but a language that is not the same as it was back then there's several steps in this process that could lead to error but I, I I'm going to just say that up, just say up front that I understand how that's kind of ironic considering what I'm talking about but the uh, the analysis here, I hope, is on point, nevertheless. And what Confucius says is, if names are not correct, if words are not clear in their meaning, then uh, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. That matters. What the truth of things is matters. So because you can't just go through life if you don't, you know, if 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 your conception of uh, where the edge of a cliff is you know if, if someone tells you and we had this problem we sent a probe to Mars where one group of scientists were using feet and the other were using meters and uh, the probe crashed because they they did not do this first thing they didn't rectify the meaning of things so they you know they were using completely different units and their meanings were screwed up so if the names be not correct language is not in accordance with the truth of things so if you think a foot is so long and you're wrong and someone says, ah, the cliff over there, you don't want to run a hundred feet that way because that's where the cliff is and you've got the, the, you don't understand what a foot is, you could run right off a cliff. I mean, assuming your eyes were closed. But you get my idea, is that the meaning, the actual meaning of words, if the language isn't, accordant, isn't in accordance with facts, you get into all kinds of trouble. And this isn't just physical facts like the distance of a foot. This, you know, biology, psychology, sociology, all of these things have to be, the way we talk about these things should be grounded in reality. And so, if language is not in accordance with the facts, then affairs cannot be carried on to success, which is sort of what I already got into. You can't, if you don't know what you're talking about, you know, if you try to work in an auto body shop and you don't know what a, a, a lug nut is and you don't know what a, a monkey wrench versus a crescent wrench then you're not going to be a, a successful member of that team. So if language is not in accordance with the facts or the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success. And when affairs cannot be carried on to success, and the words they use here are proprieties and music will not flourish. And uh, what I'm thinking of is because music was used to be thought in the ancient world a lot of times as something that sort of helped bind society together. And we probably wouldn't use music as a reference today I mean, we would probably, uh, what proprieties of music, we would probably have something like, you know, uh, our social mores, uh, you know, uh, uh, or social morals, although the word morals is kind of problematic today. People don't like it because it's been used for bad purposes, I know. But we, we would probably say these are the things that keep, that allow people to know you're, you can do this, you can't do that. So that's what that's saying, is that when, they, when things can't be carried on to success, then you know guides about the way that you are supposed to behave will not flourish and when that when that doesn't flourish then punishments and rewards will not be properly administered right if you can't clarify what is acceptable versus unacceptable behavior then when you reward people for doing good or it's, or punish them for doing bad it's all confused and then confucius goes on to say and when these are not properly administered, people don't know how to do anything. 
So you don't know what you're going to do. You don't. It's the the whole society becomes a just a minefield, where you have no idea how to act because you don't know whether you're going to step on a, on, you know, you're going to you step out of bounds and do something crazy. This all goes back, and it all follows logically from not having words very carefully and and uh, strictly defined in their meaning. Now I know a lot of people are going to say, "Yeah, but you're a word nerd." Of course you're going to say this, John, because you just like words. Well, you're getting the causation backward. I like words because they're the starting point. They're the foundation of our the the means through which we we understand the universe. It's not that I think that words are important because I like words. It's that I like words because words are important. And uh, the case that I wanted to bring up, because this is something I was thinking about the other day, I heard someone say that they felt helpless. And the word helpless just sort of dug into my head and it wouldn't leave me alone. And it suddenly occurred to me that the mistake we make with the word helpless is that what we usually mean is powerless. Helpless. Help is something from outside. Is if something a friend does or a family member or just, you know, it could be a government official. It could be, you know, a, 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 a law enforcement officer. It could be anything. It could be a charity. Help is something that comes from outside. But usually when people say they feel helpless or they say that someone is helpless, what they mean is powerless, that they can't, that that individual, whether it's themselves or someone else, can't do anything themselves. So there's a confusion there because the word helpless implies that nothing can do anything to change the person's situation for the better. And so when you use helpless, when you actually mean powerless, it leads to a sort of fatalism. That that misuse of a word can lead to a sense of, well, then there's no reason to worry about it, they're helpless. But it really means, if someone is powerless, but they're not helpless, then they should try to find help. Or someone should step in to help so that they can get out of the bad situation. Those two things aren't always the same. And it, occur, it occurred to me after you know this word bothered me so long. It was like, this person is feeling helpless. It was like, no, they're not. They're talking to their friend about it. So they're not helpless. They may be powerless. They may not be powerless, but they may feel powerless. But the fact that they have someone to reach out to is the hope that the, the mistaken word that they're using is blocking from their thinking. And then we need to distinguish these two things. I happen to think that the word helpless became this sort of catch-all phrase because it, it, uh, it sounds like hapless, which is, means something like luckless, but it's kind of an antique word and we don't use it anymore. But helpless has sort of stepped in to take its place. But we use helpless when we mean powerless, and we shouldn't because those two things mean completely different things. I mean, if you're powerless, you might not be helpless and you can get someone's help to get out of the situation. Likewise, you might be helpless, like you might not have a person to turn to in the world, but you might not be powerless, you might be able to do it yourself. So you can see how ha having these, separating these two words out and being very careful about when you use one versus the other can, be, can make all the difference in the world, particularly for someone who is either powerless or helpless, you know? Uh, it, so it goes, and you can actually see how the, the sort of steps that Confucius goes through. Let me go back to these steps again. So if the whole powerless, helpless thing, if the words, if the language isn't in accordance with the truth, if you're actually powerless, but you think of yourself as helpless, then you can't carry out anything to success because you can't, it's not occurring to you to, to that, you know, the importance and the hope that there is in finding help someplace else. And then when you can't carry things to success, then your sense of what to do and what not to do doesn't flourish. And so then you don't know what you're supposed to do. And you just sort of wallow in this fatalism, I'm helpless. Well, you might not be. Get your words right. Get your concepts. And really, that's what you mean when you mean words. Get the concepts that we use words to represent. Get those correct first. And it will help you get situations. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a personal situation or you're talking about a social situation. You know, you're talking about, a, you know, you're trying to make a business work you're trying to fix a family drama, you're trying to, whatever it is you're trying to do, get your concepts and your words correct first. And they, that may, you know, that process may teach you something. 
it may teach you something you know it, you, you follow this process here that Confucius laid out how, however long ago and you know once you start clarifying your words you might realize whoa this thing we were planning to do we probably shouldn't do it and this other thing that we hadn't even considered that might be something because you've clear once you clarify the concepts all kinds of good stuff can roll out of that anyway this is you know a rather impromptu um, podcast I don't really even know I just felt weirdly inspired to do a podcast for some reason I don't know why but I'm glad that I had sort of promised this one um, because otherwise I would just end up you know reading passages out of some book um, which I don't want to do not only because you would probably be bored out of your damn skull but also because you know I don't want to make it look like I'm trying to uh, deflect people from actually buying a book. The one I was thinking about doing some reading from was the Kumulipo, which I talked about in the last podcast. But again, it's so short. Any little bit that I would read from it would be significant. And I would rather, I mean, really, you should, if you're at all interested in in other cultures, and you well, not other cultures, this might be your culture. But if you're at all interested and you're not Hawaiian and you don't know a lot about, you know, Hawaiian traditions, um, Stuff like this is really cool because this book um, reads very much like um, it. I mean, it doesn't read like scripture. It is scripture. It wasn't written, so technically the word scripture again. Here we go. Scripture means something that's written, but it, you know, like you know, the Finnish epic Kalevala. I think that's the name of it. I may be pronouncing it wrong. It Maybe Kale Kalevala, Kalevala. I don't speak Finnish either, but anyway, it wasn't written down for a long time. Um, but it serves the same purpose in that culture that this does in Hawaiian and that, you know, uh, the book of Genesis does, the, the gospel, the, f the first part of the gospel of John, it's a creation story. Um, and it, it, it's really intriguing to get into um, that sort of thing and go back and, and see, uh, especially if you keep an open mind about the, you know, the, and realize that ancient peoples were trying to address cosmological stuff in the best way that they possibly could and you know don't just sort of tip your nose up and go oh these ridiculous superstitious people and the dumb things they believed yeah they were they were doing their best with the concepts that they had and you know in some cases like with Confucius did a damn good job with the concepts that he had I think it's stuff that's really still relevant today I mean this stuff should be taught in high school they should be teaching not just, I mean, they should be teaching a lot of things in high school that help people to think. And, you know, it's not like I'm saying we should all start becoming Chinese. I also think that, that a lot of other traditions around the world, their philosophies, uh, you know, in their most basic form, something that, you know, high school kids can absorb. But everything that I just went through from the Analects 13.3, high school kids can get that. And they should. That You know, it, it helps them understand why, you know, why they have to do vocabulary tests. Why? Because understanding what words mean leads to, uh, you know, that in this chain to understanding what to do from moment to moment in life to keep from getting punished or to get a, something that you're, you know, to get a reward of some kind. It lets you, it guides your behavior toward, toward success and away from failure. And who can argue with that, right? I mean, that's, that's basic. That's what we want for everybody, right? I mean, even our enemies. We want even our enemies to be... Um, at least successful in the moral realm, we, we want them to successfully figure out why they're wrong in being our enemies, right? So in a weird way, we want everybody to be successful. And the first way to start being successful um, is to is to get your, get your concepts straight, get your words right. And uh, I'm not just saying that as a word nerd. I'm saying that as someone who likes things to be better for everybody. Um, and here, once again, my tone has dropped. I, know, I do this every podcast. My tone star drops. So I'm going to bring it up. To say goodbye, but first, like, subscribe, and share. Maybe not in that order, but whatever the hell order you want. And tune in here after you subscribe for more thoughts of Lee.